Hello, this will be a summary of the first part of lab four in our microcontroller course. And uh, I was a bit surprised in the lab by some problems which some student groups encountered already during the first part and when connecting everything together. And then also by looking at the software, which I thought was not so complicated code. So let's do it together and I'll give you some additional explanations here. Let's start by looking into the lab instructions. So we have first the introduction here where I describe to you a way by using the shift operator to set and uh, reset individual bits in a certain control register, in this case for the timer. We will come back to this uh, when we come to the software. This is a suggestion for the construction of the second project and uh, you can, you should yeah, be inspired by this. That was the meaning for it. So here we have the pinout of our micro microcontroller, the 80 mega 328 and we will be using today the full port D starting from PD0 to PD4 up here. And then we have PD5, PD6 and PD7 here. So the eight individual bits, least significant bit here at number two, most significant bit at number 13. Then we will be using PB0, PB1, PB2 and PB3 also in the first part. And in the second part, we will later even use PB4, 5, 6 and 7. So apart from the uh, display, which we will soon see, which we have to connect to the port pins, we also have to connect supply voltage and we have the positive VCC pin here in red and ground in black, both on the left side and on the right side of our microcontroller. And both of these have to con be connected. And if you mess up anything here, then you will create a short circuit which most probably your programmer will show by actually not showing you any LED light. And uh, this should be a first warning. The second warning should be if your computer says that it doesn't find the programmer. And then you shouldn't uh, start to uh, suspect the microcontroller. You should suspect your connections first, perhaps. The display which we want to connect is described here in this picture and we have in total 16 pins on the display. It's the same that we used in lab three as well. And it's described which are which pin is which. So if we look down he up here, for example, the, pin, the third pin here from the left in the upper row, that one is the one controlling all the A segments on our display. Then we have all the B segments on the first pin, we have the C segments on the fourth pin and so on. While the first digit is controlled by the COM1 pin down here, the second digit is controlled by the COM2 pin, then we have COM3 and COM4 down here. So what we need to connect is the programmer to the programmer pins reset, SCK, MISO and MOSI. We have to connect the supply voltage. We have to connect the segments to the port D pins through a resistor network. And we have to connect the digits to PB0, PB1, PB2 and PB3. Let's do that. It might be a good idea to actually prepare for um, the connection by actually sorting out similar colored cables. You should have enough cables in your boxes, otherwise you may treat with your neighboring group, yellow for red or I don't know what, um, so that you get yeah enough cables. What I have here is eight white cables and eight green cables. I have four orange cables. I have two red and two black cables, which I will use for the power supply. You should keep to the color coding for, for these wires. Internationally, it's accepted that red wires mean a positive voltage and black means ground. Then we have another four wires here in blue. 
uh, we have the 8 resistor array here. These are 8 240 ohm resistors put onto a little holder in order to make it more convenient for you to put it into the breadboard so that you don't have to pick wire uh, resistors, bend the wires and, and put them in here. And then we also have our display, which we saw in the instruction. Um, the text side here is the lower side. You can also see it by the decimal points. So that gives you the orientation between the graph in the instruction and the real part. And we have the programmer. And we have an 80 mega 328. So let's start by putting the programmer onto the breadboard. I use a single strip breadboard here. You have the double strip ones, but uh, it's the same. You, we will only need one strip to build up this circuit anyway. And then you can see that we have VTG and ground and VTG and ground going to these pins on the underside of the programmer. These are meant to go into the supply rails, which you have alongside the board. This particular board here shows that it is uninterrupted. So, so we have a red line going all the way from the yeah, top to the bottom here, while the bread, some breadboards in the lab are of this type where you actually see there is a gap in the middle. And that means that uh, the red wire or the red line or rail goes only this far. And there's a second one down here. You can bridge it over with a short piece of wire like this. And then you have the same as on this type of breadboard that you have the rail going all the way down. So let's put it in here so that the VTG uh, lines up with the red line and the ground with the blue line, like this. And then put in the 80 mega 328. Can be sitting quite close to the programmer so that we have enough space all the way to the right here. Make sure that you put it in all the way. Make sure that no leg is bent in the process. Preferably you can leave it on the breadboard for the next lab group to have it there already so that we don't put it in and out too often. That might not be too good for the legs of the chip. Next, I will put in our eight resistors because these are between each pin of the port D and the corresponding segment on the LED matrix, as you saw in this sketch here. These are our resistors. And uh, since all PD pins go through one a certain resistor here, it's good to yeah, have it in, in between so that actually we get a nice consistent wiring here. Then we put in our display and here I recommend to not put it in all the way in the beginning so that you still see where the first pin start or where the pins start underneath the display. Um, because otherwise you might be ending up one position to the left or the right here. Here we can clearly see which pin is which. We can see it here as well. But once the display is completely down, you don't see the legs anymore underneath. Slight disadvantage. So let's uh, take these white cable. No, let's start. No, sorry. Let's start with the power supply for the microcontroller. And as we can see from the pinout, the VCC pin is pin number seven, starting from the groove here, marking the top of the chip or pin one. So I put my groove to this side here and then I can start. So this is, count, start counting. This is pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four, pin five, pin six, pin seven is here. So this is our positive supply, our VCC. 
and now it's connected to VTG coming from the programmer. Next to it, according to the pinout, we find ground, which we connect there. On the opposite side of uh, the VCC pin, directly opposite, we find the other ground pin. which is here. And then we have the other VCC pin with one pin in between, pin in between, which is a ref, which we will come to in the next lecture. Okay, these wires are in place. Let's connect our programmer. So in order to connect our programmer, we have to put wires between SCK, MISO, MOSI and RESET from the programmer to the microcontroller. I take the orange wires for this and so we have RESET here, which goes to the uppermost pin, pin number one on the microcontroller. Then we have SCK, which is the first pin next to the power supply pin here, SCK. So on our programmer, we have SCK here. Then the next pin on the microcontroller is MISO. And the last pin is MISO. Uh, mo mosi, MISO, uh, MOSI. So. so now these three wires here, they, they are sitting next to each other. And uh, here we have reset, that is the programming interface. We can't, could now already connect our programmer and see if we have connected anything uh, wrong so far, or is, if everything is right connected. So I have a USB cable here. I connect it to the programmer. And first thing I can notice is that on this particular model of the programmer, there is actually three lights coming up. One is the uh, the first, the uppermost LED here is, I getting, I'm getting five volt from the computer. That's good. The next one is that actually five volt is going out to our microcontroller. That's also good. And the third LED, um, which is labeled as LED two, is actually indicating that the software driver in our computer has actually contacted our my our programmer chip here through the USB cable. So we have both the hardware and the software connection okay to the programmer. Let's see if we have a contact to the chip. So in order to test this, I take AVR Dudes here and I'm selecting USB ASP as our programmer, a bit clock of 187.5, everything like lab three. And I press the detect button in order to see if the software detects a chip on the other side of the programmer. And it does, it detected an 80 mega 328p. So everything is correctly connected so far. That's good. Now we want to connect the segments through the resistors with the pins of port D. So having a look at where port D is, we have the first pin here to the right of the reset pin. Number two is PD0. Then comes one, two, three, four, up to the pin where we already have connected VCC. So let's take these first and I'll put them up like a binary number on our programmer or on our resistor array here so that the left the rightmost pin here will be our pd0 pd1 pd3 the 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 and let's start with pd0 pd0 goes from pin number 2 all the way to the rightmost pin of my resistors the next one goes to the 
pin number well one one from the right next one goes to the third from the right to pin number four on the microcontroller pin number five of the microcontroller goes to pin number four from the right on my resistors and then comes one more here goes here so now I've reached the pin where there is already the red wire for the power supply and that tells me that I have to jump over somehow so let us see where we continue so we have the VCC and ground which are already connected then comes PB6 and PB7 so pin port B wraps around here like this so after the supply pins we leave two pins unconnected and then we have number five six and seven of port D so we leave one two unconnected and then the third one goes here the next one goes here and the last one goes here so these are these connection made connections made um now I want to have the bit zero connected to the segment A of the LCD as we have seen in this sketch here so our PD0 goes through its resistor and to the third pin on the upper side of the LED display D0, oh sorry, D0 here, the first resistor from the right, goes to the third, one, two, three. And now I can actually push the LED chip all the way down because now I can orientate myself relative to this green wire here. The B is one over to the left here that goes to the second the third one is to be connected to segment C and that is the one to the right right of A so that would be this pin here then we have the so this was zero one and two now comes three pd3 is down here it's opposite to a that is the d segments so the fourth wire from the resistors goes to the one which directs is directly opposite to our A pins. We can lift out the LED chip a bit and see that it really is the third pin which we are connecting to. It is. So this is correct. I move it one out of the way further down here um, just to make things more visible. Then we have PD4. Where does PD4 go? The E segment is one over to the right one over to the right would be here and that goes to the next empty pin on the resistor array then we want to connect pd5 pd5 is here so we leave one empty to the last one we have connected which was a pd2 on this side and then go into pin number 11 of the led display so we leave one empty, that one would be this one, and go into this one here and connect it here. Now we have two cables left of the green ones and uh, the next one would be PD6. It goes here in the gap between segment A and B, which is segment G. 
So let's do that. Segment G is connected to the next resistor on our resistor array and through that to PD6 on the microcontroller. And now we have the last one to connect of this group and the last one to connect of this group would be the decimal point which is down here so it's one over again from where we left off on the lower side so not this one but this pin here and that one goes to the last position of our eight resistors so these are the segments connected to the microcontroller and now we have four wires left, which are supposed to be connecting now the digits from our LED matrix here to the B0, B1, B2 and B3 pins of our microcontroller. We are looking back into where things are supposed to be going. PB0 is supposed to be going to the first common first pin on our display. So that would be here. But where is pin B0 on our microcontroller? Well, we scroll up to the picture of the pinout and we see that PB0 is the last pin on this side of the chip. And then we have one, two, and three in sequence starting on the other side. So our B0 goes here. And it's starting to blink here because there's code already in the microcontroller. Then we have this one, which goes to B1. And we have now, let me look again. So that would have been the PB1. PB2 is the one between segment E and decimal point here. So let's try to find it on our board. So it would be between these wires here, goes here. And we have one more to connect and that is the rightmost pin of our display here and that one goes to goes to pin over here and now actually we, we see that the code example from the instructions is already r running in our microcontroller it shows a zero on the first uh, say this digit here then a one then a two then a three Contrast is not the very best with the green LEDs under this, this illumination, but I think you can see it. So that was the hardware. And now we would come to the software part. And for this, actually, you have in the instructions here a, yeah, it's let's call it a skeleton of program code. Um, it's also available on Studium with the advantage that if you take it from Studium, we might be able to copy it more easily than from the PDF document. So let's go to the code templates here in our Studium code. And so here we have this code template. I copy it directly from this page and I go to Admiral Studio. In Admiral Studio, I start a new project. I don't care what it's called. Yeah, I do care what it's called. So let's call it 2021, 11, 14, today's date. Microcontroller is an M32.8 and I call it four digit LED timer. Lost the D here. Might actually add uh, underscore here. It should be in GCC executable project. Um, you didn't see that I chose what I typed here. Here it is. 
Um, so we say OK and we have to select the chip and we can actually just enter 328 in the search field up here and we will find our microcontroller and then we will come to this pre-made template by the IDE. We just copy in our code from Studium and sadly a paste operation uh, like this into Atmel or Microchip Studio uh, messes up the indentation which I left here in these multi-row instructions. So I will adjust and nicen this, these three lines up here a bit by adding the spaces so that we end up under the uh, equal sign with our OR signs here. And uh, well, this, this code will not compile, but we can have a look at what it contains so far. We're telling the compiler that we have a CPU frequency of one megahertz. This is important if we want to do something with delay routines from uh, the delay.h uh, library. Actually, Ben Eater has released a nice video the other day on delays and uh, or sleep parts functions on the 6502 microprocessor board which he is developing and uh, I could put the link into the description here. It tells you something about how these delay works as well. We are including the library interrupt.h because we want to use interrupts and I also, but I didn't use it so far, included the atomic library here um, which can actually make code bits or pieces of code um, which are not interrupted by interrupts. So it can disable interrupts for certain pieces of code. Then much like, uh, like the lab 3, we have the bit patterns here for the 10 decimal numbers on a seven segment display. You can go back to the lab instructions of lab number three and you will see how these look. Um, or we could actually we, we could actually look at one of them. Let's look at one of them here. Um, choose a, num a random number. I'll choose the 4F here. Let's let's have a look what 4F is and how it's related to our display. So we have 0x4F as hexadecimal number. It's an 8-bit hexadecimal number. We have two hexadecimal digits. And if we want to translate it back into binary, then we look at these separately. So a 4 is actually 0, 1, 0, 0. That is the 4. And an F is 1, 1, 1, 1. All bits set. So this is not a real space here. I just uh, left this, um, yeah, some gap here in order to show where the 4 went and where the F went. So how does this relate now to our display? Well, our display consists of our seven segments. Like this, we have the A, B, C, D, E, F, and G segment. And we have the decimal point. And now let's have a look where th how these bits relate to our display according to how we wired up our system. We connected the D0 port pin to the A segment. The, we connected the second one to the B, then to the C, then to the D, then to the E, F, G, and to the decimal point. So this is our wiring which we just did. 
the green and white wires on our board here. So we have a one here now, so that means we want to turn on this segment. We have a one here, we want to turn on this segment. We have a one here, we want to turn on this segment. We also have a one turning on this segment here. And we have a one on this segment. And you see that the number three evolved in front of our eyes here. So this is how the number three is coded in our font. We will not use the frame buffer for now, but we have a, another global variable here, the uint8 current digit. As we can see from the running code already, there's only one digit active at a certain time. So we are showing the first digit, second, third, fourth, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. In C code, we normally start numbering by zero. So this would be our digit zero, one, two, and three. And here we store globally which segment is active right now. Then we have our main down here. Everything starts in the main. By the way, up here you can actually quickly go to the different functions which you have defined in your code. By just clicking here, we end up in our main. So this is where our processor starts its execution of code. And the first thing it sees is that it's supposed to be calling or executing what's in the function in it, which doesn't take any arguments. So let's see where in it is. In it is here. And uh, we are setting the data direction registers DDRB and DDRD for the two ports which we are using. We are using connections on port D, the white cables here, and port B, the blue cables. On the port B, we only need the lower four pins, B0, B1, P, B2, and B3 as outputs. But on the port D, we need all of them. So we have the 0, 1, 2, 3, the 4, 5, 6, and 7 bits, all set to 1. All pins on the port D are outputs. Then we want to initialize our timer. And uh, here we see already a couple of zeros filled in. And this probably means that we don't have to touch any of these. So some groups actually started by randomly writing over these with, with other information. But uh, no, the only thing which you are supposed to be looking up is the underscores here where there are gaps. And it's described in the text of the instructions that you are supposed to be running timer zero in its normal mode. And uh, then th this is defined by the WGM bits, as we will see in a second. And uh, then the CS0201 and 00 bits here, they are actually responsible for setting the frequency which with our 8-bit timer will count. So let's have a look into the instructions again. Because the essential parts for these are actually copied into the instructions as well. You can look it up in the data sheet or we can have a look here. TCCR0A is the timer counter control register A. TCCRB 0B is the timer counter control register B. So we have in total 16 bits here which determine the functions of the hardware in the timer. There are four bits which actually have no function here. They are reserved for future use as the data sheet says. Um, so we can just ignore them. We see that 
The other bits, they all have names. And in the data sheet, we see a detailed explanation of these uh, names in general. And if there are two bits which belong together like these, or three bits which belong together like these, they are normally followed by a table describing all the possible combinations between the bits and what they will affect. So the WGM bits were the first bits which we had to look up. And uh, they, they are all empty and uh, they are actually, uh, or WGM comes from the waveform generator mode, which is the timer counter mode of operation in other words. And we see that there is a mode which is numbered zero here where all the three bits are zero and this is called normal operation top here, according to the description in the um, data sheet, means that our counter will start counting at zero and count to the value hexadecimal FF or 255 in decimal or until all eight bits are ones. And this is then the normal code. What happens in the next step? In the next step it will add one to this number which would then create an overflow because uh, the number one zero zero in hexadecimal cannot be represented in eight bits anymore. Instead we will get a zero zero and our timer will start from zero again. So our timer will continuously count zero to 255, back to zero, back to 255, back to zero, back to 255 and so on. And every time it goes back to zero, we want later to actually have an interrupt updating our display by jumping to the next digit. And then the next and the next. So what do we have to put into these bits? Well, VWGM02 should be a zero. VW WGM01 should be a zero and WGM00 should be a zero. So all three of these bits should be zero. So if I change these now to all zeros here, then the next question is what actually this whole construction does, which I've put up here. And for this we also go back to our paper over here. So we have the TCCR0A register, which has the bits as described in the data sheet named com 0 a 1 com 0 a 0 com b com 0 b 1 com 0 b 0 then comes two bits without anything and then comes our i have to put it a little bit shorter here our w1 and w0 bit so we have eight bits in this register which are described by a binary number and uh, we can actually have a look back into our data sheet here and we, we could actually determine that yes we want a zero here 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 so we could in this particular case just write it as 0b 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 and that, that would be perfectly fine for our compiler. We could also translate it to 0x 0, 0, 0 in hexadecimal or we could just write 0 in decimal. All of these are equivalent and will set zeros to all these individual positions. But in our compiler actually we have these names, these cryptic names, defined as numeric values. So we actually can look up in the 
libraries which are included that we will find a WGM01 defined as a 1. We will find that WGM00 is defined as a 0. We will also find that com 0 b oh, I shouldn't start it with b well b1 is defined as a 5 and that com 0 b0 zero is actually defined as a 4 com 0 a1 is a 7 and com 0 a 0 is defined as a 6. So what can we do with this? Well, we can actually do what you will find in the code tccr 0 a equals a 0 left shift operator com 0 a 1 or a 0 Shift left operator, zero, com, zero, a zero. Or, 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 or. This or doesn't mean an or in a comparison fashion. It's a binary or operation, which if we uh, remember how this looked, we have uh, two variables a and b, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. a or b gives us a 1 in the result if either one of the two or both of them are actually 1s. So this will actually add together the results. If there's a 1 in one of these parentheses, or in any of the other parentheses, then they will be ORed up together. But they will be bitwise ORed, which means that if we have, for example, and this is not these numbers now, if we have, for example, 0B, 0, 01, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which comes from a 1 which has been shifted 6 positions to the left and we will or it together with 0b 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, which comes from a 1 which has been shifted 4 positions 1, 2, 3, 4 positions to the left or 0b 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 which comes from a 1 which has been shifted 0 positions to the left. If we do the logical OR of all these three numbers here now, we will end up with a 0 in the first position here because there is not a single 0 or not, not a single 1 in these numbers. Here we have 1, 1. That gives us a 1 or 0 or 0. Gives us a 1. Here again we now have three zeros, gives us a zero in the result. Here we have a one at this position, so we will get a one. Then we have a column again here without any one. We have another column without ones and yet another column without ones. And we have a one at the last position as well. And this then could be the value which we want to put in our timer controller timer control register. So by using the fact that the name of the bits is defined in the libraries, we can actually write in our source code which bit by name we want to be a 0 or a 1 and thus identify it later without actually having to count uh, the bit position in a binary number like the ones up here if we want to change something. We just change this one to 1 and then we know that we get a 1 at the WGM00 position, wherever that is in the binary number. 
So we have a look now at the data sheet once more. If I manage to find it, there it is. And uh, so we also want to uh, set the uh, clock select bits here. And uh, these are described in this table here. We have the zero, CS02, CS01, CS00 bit. And if they're all zero, then the timer counter is stopped, which we don't want. Then we have a couple of choices here. How many is it? Five choices. No prescaling, divide by 8, 64, 256, and 1024. This means the CPU clock, which is 1 megahertz, is divided by 1, by 8, by 64, by 256, or by 1024 before it goes into our timer. So by choosing, for example, the divide by 8 factor here, how will that work? Um, so we have F CPU is 1 megahertz divided by 8 would be 125,000 hertz. So our timer would count with this frequency from 0 to 255. So 256 steps. This here is a step time of one microsecond. Here we have the frequency and here we have the corresponding time. So if we have one million steps per second, that means that each step is one microsecond long. Here divided, we divided by eight. So each of these is eight microseconds long. So if we now count these 256 steps from zero to 255, it will take us 256 times eight microseconds. And uh, that is actually, um, should be 2048 microseconds. So every 2048 microseconds, we get an overflow. How many are these per second? Um, well, this is approximately two milliseconds. And that means we have about 500 overflows Per second. So 500 overflows per second, um, which means that uh, yeah, every two milliseconds we would go from one digit to the next. Obviously, it's going much slower right now, so it's not the divide by eight prescaler. But let's choose the divide by eight prescaler. And uh, to do so, we would have to set our bits to this combination here. CS02 is zero, CS01 a one, CS00 is zero. So we go back to our code and do it. We write zero, we write one, and we write zero. What happens in the next row? In the next row, we are actually enabling the timer overflow interrupt. Also here, don't touch what's already there. It doesn't have to. We can later experiment with what happens if you change anything else. But for now, we, oh, we, we only replace the underscores in the code. So then we also have to enable global interrupts for our microcontroller and we do it with the command SEI, -E, S -E S -E um, say, and uh, then actually from this point on, every time an interrupt in the timer happens, because we have enabled the timer overflow interrupt, we will get an interrupt. And during this interrupt, or 
when this interrupt happens, our microcontroller will abandon its work, its current, its current work, and jump into our interrupt service routine here. And what it does here is it first puts out all ones to the port D segments. Common says that this means all segments are off. Look back into lab 3 why this is the case, if you don't remember. Then we take our variable current digit here, our global variable, and step it up by 1. So if it was 0 now, then I have a 1 now. In the next row, we are using the modulo operator, and this will keep it in the range 0 to 3 if we take modulo 4, because a division by 4 has a remainder which is between 0 and 3. So if we reach the 4 here, if we had a 3, go through this routine, we add 1, we have a 4 here, then we take the remainder of the division by 4, which is 0, and our current digit counter restarts from 0. We will put out a 1 on the current digits bit of port B by shifting a 1 current digit positions to the left, exactly the same way as I just described for the other shifting. And then we will fetch from the current from the font here the value which is indexed by the current digit. So for the first digit we will pick the number zero contents of our array. Then for the next one we will take 0, 06 for the next one we will take 0x5b and for the last one 0x4f and then the whole procedure will start over again so this is the code which is essentially running in our microcontroller i'll compile this code here it says 310 bytes of uh, code memory is needed and 11 bytes of data memory um, 11 bytes because our well actually I would have expected it to be 12 bytes because this is 10 bytes this is one byte and this is another byte but uh, one of these two variables seems to be put into a special uh, in, into one of the CPU registers for easy access I assume it's the current digit which stays there so code has compiled correctly. Now go we go to Avedudes and we are trying to find this code, which should be this one here. And I put the display over here. So the only thing which should change as compared to what was already inside the microcontroller would be the speed of the display right now because it should go much faster. So I will transition over to our microcontroller here and on Aviadudes I will now program. And well, is it visible on the video? I don't know. I can try to actually switch off this light. And yes, that works. So we have a quite steady display of 0123 on our display here. And that's it for the first part.